We should be going live soon. Hi everyone, this is Chicho. Welcome to my channel and welcome to another live stream. Today is December 21st, the first day of winter. And we're doing a live stream on Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. And this is the seventh live stream that we're doing uh, on WikiLeaks right now. And we've done some in between stuff as well. We did a couple of readings. We're going to do more readings of WikiLeaks releases. But here's our playlist. Uh, if you're interested in what we've done so far, okay, there's a WikiLeaks and Julian Assange playlist. And we've done basically five well we've got 13 videos out here we did a whisper reading of Walt 7 uh, from WikiLeaks I believe in 2000 and within a few months of them releasing uh, Vault 7 which is extremely important the and this playlist is reverse order so the newest is on the top and we did a couple of live streams back to back when Julian Assange was pulled out of the Ecuadorian embassy by the UK police. And once his uh, extradition hearing kicked into gear, the court hearing and stuff, we've been doing regular live streams uh, regarding Julian Assange. And we did a soft-spoken reading of uh, the Guantanamo Bay files, which are extremely, extremely important. And then uh, we did some short segments. I cut up some short segments from the live streams and posted it in the playlist, okay? And right now in the playlist, if you're watching this on December 21st, um, it's up to part five of the live streams we did. We did a part six, but I haven't uploaded that yet because uh, I want to do the reading for the OPCW DOMA documents before I do the live stream for that because we're going to be referencing that. And uh, during the part six, which is when we did the DOMA readings, um, discussion uh, what they meant regarding the importance of WikiLeaks and the war in Syria and propaganda and truth tellers or whatnot WikiLeaks has released the third part of the OPCW uh, DOMA report leaks and we didn't get a chance to do the reading of part three when we we're doing a live stream previously so we will be doing a reading of part three in this live stream and i have a whole bunch of other content that we're going to take a look at the first one we're going to start off with is uh, this one which is basically uh, sort of a short six minute seven minute little update that dan cohen released regarding the opcw which will give you a pretty good recap of what we've covered so far and where we're heading with this information uh, aside from that uh, we're gonna wait until people roll in uh, that was sort of a long uh, intro on my part because we've done a fair bit so far hello Starsky how are you doing why so many Assange streams uh, because Starsky uh, what's going on with Assange is extremely important it's probably uh, in the top five of the most important things that are going on in the world right now and that's without exaggeration some some people would consider it being a top two some people would consider it being the most important for me right now three of the top five things that are taking actually there's top 10 really because we do follow a lot of information but two of the main ones right if i had to pick narrow it down to two things that are taking place that are extremely important globally. Hello, Lonely Piggy, how are you doing? Good afternoon to you and chat. Hope all is well, as always, as always, Lonely Piggy. Sup? Dante, how are you doing? So the two most important things, as far as I'm concerned, that have taken place in the world right now, one of them is what's taking place with Julian Assange, okay, and WikiLeaks. And in that same breath, if we want to understand how important What's going on with WikiLeaks and Julian Assange's is the OPCW DOMA doc releases. That would be one of the top two in my book as far as I'm concerned regarding how important things are. The other one would be the Washington Post of all places 
uh, Afghanistan papers, which reveal that the U.S. government for the last three administrations, basically from Bush, George, Bush uh, George Jr., Obama, and Trump, have been lying to the American people and the whole administration. It's not just the presidents, but all of them. Hundreds, if not thousands of people have been lying to the American people and the world saying that the Afghanistan war is going to come to an end. They know what they're doing. They're winning and stuff like this, right? Those are the two most important things in my book right now. And of course, we have Bolivia, Iran, Middle East, and all that jazz going on. I don't know much about Assange. Could you give me an insight? Starsky, we will. This video, uh, we're going to start off the stream with listening to this seven minute video okay by dan cohen so let me link this in the chat for people because this will get everybody caught up with what's taking place right now specifically regarding the opcw doma documents the leaks and we talked about this how important these leaks are which is basically anyone that was following what was going on in Syria and definitely knew that Syria would have not used chemical weapons during that time against its own citizens, right? But there was no proof. We argued out of reason, out of history, that there's no way they would have used it, right? There was some uh, secondhand news reports that were coming up because the area was occupied by ISIS, right so no western journalists really had any access to it no independent western journalists anyway the ones that had access to it were basically paid shills from the western propaganda machines and allowed to go in there through isis so they 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 were connected up with them right but basically the news that we were getting out out at the time If you looked into it just one level deeper than the corporate propaganda, you knew that it was a lie, that Syria wouldn't use chemical weapons, that it was a false flag. These OPC documents reveal that. And when that stuff was happening, when Syria supposedly chemical attack happened in Doma, it was the only time where the United States was united. It wasn't bipartisan, where the Democrats, the corporate propagandists, the Repu some of the Republicans, some of them not, but the full Democratic machine and the Western mainstream media was in support of Trump bombing Syria, which he did, right? Now it's come out that that was a false flag. UK, Britain, and the United States bombed the country because of a false flag operation. And the OPCW is an organization for the prevention of chemical weapons in the world and all that jazz. It's come out that they lied, right? They falsified documents and omitted information and 20, 20 or more of their inspectors have now come out saying that this organization lied. And that lie was huge because not only did France, UK and United States bomb Syria, right? For no reason right we almost started a war with russia okay and you have to remember that china also backs syria so a global war a world war almost began on a false flag humongous this should be on the front pages of every news organization that you are reading if it's not then you are reading propaganda you are being programmed and there's an article here that i would like to read as well in this live stream which is the art of double speak bellingcat bellingcat and mind control and we'll talk about what what this article is about who bellingcat is and stuff like this and this is written by edward Curtin, and is a fantastic article fantastic article Right. It's the first time this article is the first time I've ever read anything from um, Edward Curtin. OK. Good evening from where I am, Randall. Good evening from where you are or good evening from where I am. And good evening to you, wherever you are. Right. OK. Now, I just went to a lot of intro uh, that I was planning on doing about. Well, we're 10 minutes in. So should we start 
doing a little bit of recap from what we've covered so far okay hmm. okay i gotta make this smaller so we can see the whole thing okay cool hopefully that's coming out okay i just gotta check it yeah that looks okay okay so let me close this again bring up the chat and what we're gonna do is i'm gonna put on my headphones and we're gonna take a look at the seven minute recap of what the opcw the doma report meant has meant and this was a really good recap okay good evening good evening scarlet phoenix how are you doing and while i you know we're gonna wait a couple of more minutes i just want to make sure that everyone um, or a majority of people that wanted to be here will be here uh, to catch the recap from the beginning uh, and while we're waiting let me show you this here is here's my trusted tea right and my snacks and stuff that I have here this is uh, chocolate tea that we made last night so sometimes we make tea and keep it uh, for the next day to drink we put this sometimes in the fridge and have it cold I have blackberry liqueur okay this is the first time I'm the first or second time I'm tasting the blackberry liqueur that we made during one of the live streams and it is fantastic oh, very good very good and I hope you guys have snacks. And today I brought out some uh, pumpkin seeds. Okay. The blackberry liqueur is strong enough to give me enough energy to be able to read and go through what we're about to go through. Okay. Let's do a little recap, gang. Let's listen to what uh, Dan Cohen has to say. And let me grab the link again and post it in the chat. Last April, the United States bombed Syria. Oops. Let me, by the way, let me know if the sound quality is, if the sound is too high or too low. Okay. Last April, the United States bombed Syria after accusing its president of a deadly chemical weapons attack against his own people. Now, the UN body that investigated the incident is accused by one of its own of altering a report after being pressured by the US. WikiLeaks published a leaked email written by an unnamed investigator from the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, or OPCW. Its author accuses the organization of misrepresenting the facts its field team found in the Syrian town of Douma at the behest of its general director. The email blasts the interim report that the OPC released to the public as disingenuous and calls it a major deviation from the original report. There are a lot of details to follow here, but this story has huge implications for international law. So here's a quick recap of the background to this leaked email. On April 7, 2018, the United States accused Syria of using chlorine and sarin chemical weapons in Douma, a suburb of Damascus that had been occupied by the Saudi-backed jihadist group Jaysh al-Islam. Unverifiable videos surfaced, claiming to show the immediate aftermath which more than 40 people were killed. These videos were shown non-stop in Western media outlets. Before any investigation could take place, the American, British, and French militaries launched about 100 airstrikes. Jim Mattis, then Secretary of Defense, admitted that the US had no proof that the chemical attack even happened or who might have been behind it. Well, I cannot tell you that we had evidence, even though we certainly had a lot of media and social media indicators that either chlorine or sarin were used. The fact that the U.S. illegally bombed another country should have been an outrage in itself. That it attacked without having any evidence to back up its accusations should have been seen as a monumental scandal. But as we saw in 2017, when the U.S. attacked Syria under similarly murky circumstances, when it comes to bombing, the supposedly anti-Trump media establishment suspends all skepticism and goes full MAGA. I think uh, Donald Trump became president of the United States. I think this was actually a big moment. Now, I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons. Besides, what higher authority gave the U.S. the right to attack Syria in the first place? 
Well, the U.S. has never cared much for international law and prefers to make up its own rules. When John Bolton was the Bush administration's ambassador to the United Nations back in 2002, he bullied the OPCW head Jose Bustani out of office because Bustani wanted his experts to inspect Iraq for the weapons of mass destruction the U.S. said existed. Of course, that was a huge lie. The WMDs didn't exist. The very same John Bolton was Trump's national security advisor when the 2018 chemical attack supposedly happened too. The latest leaked email comes months after two other whistleblowers cast major doubts on the OPCW's findings. In May, one leaked an engineering assessment saying that the gas cylinders supposedly used in the Duma attack were manually placed. This meant the Syrian government wasn't behind the attack and indicates they were placed to falsely incriminate Assad, aka a false flag. And in October, a second whistleblower accused the OPCW of unacceptable practices, saying that key information and witness testimonies were suppressed in order to favor a preordained conclusion. In other words, that whistleblower said the OPCW cooked up the results of its investigation. 10 days after the supposed Duma chemical attack, an OPCW fact-finding mission entered the area with the Russian military providing security. In early July, the OPCW published its highly anticipated interim report. Among its findings, no evidence of sarin. That refuted one of the central claims the U.S. government and anonymous intelligence officials promoted with the help of corporate media stenographers and experts. In fact, Siri had used chlorine and sarin gas against its own innocent people. Those are hallmark symptoms of sarin gas poisoning. The interim report also said various chlorinated organic chemicals were found, but made no mention of levels. That's the crucial factor in determining if chlorine could have been used as a weapon or if it was an amount found in mundane everyday uses like drinking water or a swimming pool or common household products like bleach. That omission fueled skepticism among close observers. Turns out they were right to have doubts. The recently leaked email says the chlorinated organic derivatives detected were as low as one to two parts per billion which is essentially trace quantities. The email also says purposely singling out chlorine gas as one of the possibilities is disingenuous and that the term used in the report, reactive chlorine containing chemical, is inaccurate. The email says the interim report used insufficient evidence to make claims about how the attack was supposedly carried out omitted a section on inconsistencies in the victim's symptoms, and concludes that the interim version no longer reflects the work of the team. That pretty much puts to bed the theory of a chlorine attack and lends credence to the second whistleblower's claim that the OPCW tried to twist the evidence to fit a pre-established narrative. It gets even more suspicious. The newly leaked email was sent to the OPCW's then cabinet chief, Bob Fairweather, about two weeks before the report was released, meaning the OPCW knew about the complaints before it published. Just two days before the release, Fairweather reportedly invited several members of the team that wrote the report inside his office. There, they met three U.S. government officials who did not clearly identify themselves, but insisted that the Syrian government had carried out a gas attack. Sounds like another John Bolton-style intimidation tactic designed to bolster the U.S. government's justification for its attacks. Altogether, the claims from the three whistleblowers point towards something much more insidious than the U.S. just bombing a country because it wants to. The evidence points towards a false flag, a massive deception carried out by a fanatical jihadist group, the U.S. government, and a Western media disinformation apparatus. From WMDs in Iraq, the Gulf of Tonkin in Vietnam, or the USS Maine in Cuba, the United States has a long history of false flags and war propaganda. Maybe we'll never see hard evidence that's what happened in Duma, but the OPCW has lost credibility, and the U.S. is once again lying to its own people to wage war on a country whose crime is determining its own path. Here's a tweet again that uh, we just watched for anyone that's rolling in. Uh, you're wondering what's going on. Okay, that is basically a recap of what had taken place up to November 17th. That's when the tweet occurred, right? And that includes basically what we covered 
the information where we read the sort of the this and this page that I'm gonna give you with the WikiLeaks or OPC uh, DOMA page is just the intro that we've been reading, right? And in part, I guess this is part seven of the live stream that we're doing regarding Julian Assange. We read this guy and this guy, these two, this one and this one in the last stream. We are going to read this new release, part three, in a few minutes, okay? And this video that we just watched does not include this information that was released in part three. In the video, it mentions that there was basically, by that time, two people from the OPCW inspectors that had come out and said, OPCW is lying, they omitted our information. Part three reveals that over 20 of the chief inspectors of the OPCW that conducted the investigation, their information, main information that pointed towards there only being chase amounts of chlorine and that the uh, so-called supposed bombs that were dropped, they were placed and it was all a lie and it was a false flag, right? So in this latest OPCW release part three from WikiLeaks, there's 20 plus inspectors coming out and saying, yep, OPCW lied and almost started a world war, okay, on behest of the United States, the UK and France in Syria. Ba that's basically the gist of it so far, okay. Now, what, what I want to do is read this latest release, the OPCW DOMA docs that were released on December 14th, okay. And what we're going to do is from here, um, this, uh, by the way, let me give you this link as well. This link is uh, Caitlin Johnson that on December 14th, so on December 14th, the part three of the OPCW DOMA reports were released. On December 15th, Caitlin Johnson must have been working over time, right? She went through those leaks and wrote a very in-depth article on what the implications are of this part three of the OPC document releases, which is the luge of the title of the article is the luge of new leaks further sheds sheds the establishment Syria narrative. And it's a fairly long piece. Okay, very long piece that goes into detail. And Caitlin Johnson is phenomenal. She goes into detail, provides links, uh, backs her story up, right? Uh, Diabolic alien. So wait, I'm not too uh, brushed up on my foreign relations. What reason did the OPCW have to lie about this? Just curious, not trying to disprove or discredit. What reason, you know what? Uh, did they get paid off? Uh, why did they lie? Here's, here's the question, right? Some people say that uh, some of the top OPCW inspectors uh, were threatened. Like John Bolton has threatened inspectors the United Nations officials by mentioning that they know where they live. J just imagine John Bolton coming to you, coming to your office and saying, hey, do what we're wanting you to do, right? Remember, we know where you live. We know where your children are, right? Some people say it was because of that. That's the reason they lied. Some people say they took kickbacks. Some people say the... There's ideology behind that, that certain people have been put in place to make sure that they control the narrative, right? Just like, why does CNN lie? Why does ABC lie? Why, why, why does BBC lie? Why do these institutions lie, right? I wouldn't be surprised if the OPC people were threatened. Uh, I wouldn't be either, because we know it has occurred in the past, right? We know it has occurred in the past. And it's, this is like... I can't even emphasize how large this thing is, right? Let me give, let, let's go through the tabs before we read this OPCW doc, okay? Just to show you what I've got laid out for you because there's no way we're gonna get through it all, right? So this is the OPCW thing, uh, release, WikiLeaks release. This is the article that Caitlin Johnson has written regarding this, very informative. You wanna, you wanna read it, okay? 
We're going to watch this interview. This is a Newsweek uh, reporter quits after editor blocks coverage of OPCW Syria scandal. I'm going to start providing these links in the chat. And if you're watching this video after the live stream, if you're watching it on uh, BitChute or YouTube or any other platform, I'll provide the links in the description of the video. Okay, so we're going to watch this full video so you don't have to look at it now. Um, watch the video now. The odds are this is the article that we're going to read. Okay, by Edward Curtin. Okay. Here's Edward Curtin. This is a phenomenal article. I really like uh, this one doesn't specifically go into the OPCW leak, but we're going to read the introduction here. Right. So I'm OK with moving away a little bit from the nitty gritty details of it, which Caitlin Johnson outlines here to read a general overview, because it's very important for us to get a wide lens perspective on what's taking place in the world right now. OK. And I've, there's two articles I've read from Edward Curtin. He hasn't put out very many articles as of yet. I plan on, from what I could find anyway, I plan on, plan on reading everything that he's put out. Okay. And this article is called The Art of Doublespeak, Bellingcat and Mind Control. Okay. And uh, this is a long article. We're going to read it. Okay. I really want to read this to you guys because it outlines a lot of things we've been talking about. And Bellingcat, this organization here, I had to look into a little bit more because I heard their name being thrown around through Caitlin jo Johnson's article and previously as well. And it's come up in this interview that I want to watch. But once you dig into Billing Cat and I have, you know, you want to read the propaganda, you can read the propaganda, you go to Billing Cat. Here's a wiki page for Billing Cat. Again, take Wikipedia with a gigantic grain of salt. You have to find maybe one or two words in a whole article to really understand where the political leaning of Wikipedia. So you, most people would use this as a first source. Uh, okay with a first glance to see what's going on, but you got to dig deep, right? So Billing, Billing Cat, it says, is an investigative journalist journalism website that specializes in fact-checking open source intelligence, right? Blah, blah, blah. Now you dig down and you find out that the person that started this was Elliot Higgins, right? You go to Elliot Higgins, and you find out, oh, this guy was a blogger and does this, and he's focusing on Russia for some reason and serious of war and uh, talking about Ukraine. So there's a sort of agenda here. And what you can do is go down here and click it, uh, go to the Atlantic Council, and the guy's hooked up with the Atlantic Council. So right away, it's a neoconservative think tank that basically is a propaganda arm of the U.S. military industrial complex. So keep that in mind. Propaganda arm of the U.S. military industrial complex the person working for that is running Billing Cat, and the Atlantic Council is a neoconservative think tank. That's a war waging machine, right? And then there's a, another article by Caitlin Johnson again on Consortium News saying the narrative managers face plant on OPCW scandal spin job, right? And this was released on November 27th, so before pre. The 2000, uh, the December 14th release. Okay, we're not going to read this. I just had highlighted this. I'm going to skim through this after the stream to save the links. Okay, yeah, American propaganda. Uh, here's an article by Nils Melsner that is entitled "Pay the Price for Speaking Out Rather Than the Price for Keeping Silent." This one. Uh, uh, Nils, Mills Nelsner is the person that uh, has basically come out and said that the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture has come out and says, has stated that the UK is torturing Julian Assange, which they are, right? Huge. N Nils Melsner speaking out is gigantic. Okay. And then here's an open letter by a whole bunch of doctors and lawyers and all these people saying that Julian Assange needs to be released or he's going to die. Okay, is there a similar page to Wikipedia for historic and political matters? Uh, Scarlet Phoenix, I would not trust Wikipedia for historic or political matters. The only reason, the only reason I looked into Wikipedia and I look use Wikipedia for certain institutions and stuff like this because if you click, 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 you just basically find out who's running it, 
that's the reason I came here to see Bellingcat. I wasn't really concerned about what Bellingcat is releasing. It's like looking at scientific funding, right? You can read all the reports that you want, um, doctors in scientific journals and all this stuff coming out, praising something or dismissing something or whatnot. The articles, before you read anything from any scientific study, what you need to do is dig down and find out who's funding that study. So before you spend a lot of time reading anything from any reports coming out on, on this kind of level, news, science, medicine, and all this jazz and agriculture, right? Because we know Monsanto and stuff funds a lot of agricultural studies that they promote, right? Uh, look into who's running things, right? And for Bilderberg, I just clicked on Elliot Higgins to see who's running it. And you go to Elliot Higgins, you find out he's connected with the Atlantic Council. Atlantic Council is a neoconservative think tank that is basically one of the propaganda arms of the U.S. military industrial complex when it comes to intervention. Okay. Uh, this is the open letter. And then there's more, more significant. And then we get into the Afghanistan papers, which is huge. We, could, we should be actually doing a full live stream on the Afghanistan papers. Okay, and if you want to get an idea of what the Afghanistan papers are, here is this guy here. Okay, uh, da -da 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 -da. there's similar page to Wikipedia for historic and political matters, which is not biased. Ugh. All right, the, the Wikipedia would be biased, pro and anti, right? Oh, I never use Wikipedia for politics. Too many opinions, too many opinions. You're not going to find anything that's not biased. No, I agree with Dante. You're not going to find anything that's not biased. However, outright lying through major omission is huge, right? Freedom to people who don't have, have freedom. Yeah. So let's have a read through the OPC. Sup, guys? Waban, how are you doing? How's life? Welcome, welcome. Should we do this? Let me do a little sip. Now we're not going to read the whole thing. We're just going to read part three because we've already read the first two parts of the release. We've already read the internal OPC emails from November 23rd. And we already read the OPCW whistleblower panel on the DOMA attack on April 2018 that was released in 23rd October 2019. Okay. And that sounds coming in, I guess it's uh, people subbing or following and stuff. And if I'm not catching it, thank you very much for the subs. Thank you very much for the follows. Okay. So let's do the OPCW, just this part three reading. And it's not very long. It's quite short. It's just up to here. And then after this, what we're going to do, we're going to watch this video about a news reporter working for Newsweek that quit his job because well, we'll find out. He wanted to report on the OPCW Syria scandal, but the agencies from Newsweek, the management said, no, we're not sharing that information. So this is occurring in every Western and every news agency around the world, right? So sometimes you have to go to outside news agencies from your country to be able to get information regarding your own country. That is why the role of Wikipedia, a WikiLeaks, it's so, so important because it provides a platform for insiders to leak information that they believe is the public interest, right? Such as the OPCW leaks regarding DOMA, which almost kicked us into World War III. Holy schmoles, right? Wow, wow, wow. Unbelievable. Do you think Trump is right about mainstream media news? Yeah, for sure. I don't think anybody disagrees that mainstream media is just propaganda. It's I wouldn't use the word fake news. It's their news. It's propaganda. Right? 90, 90, even if they might report some truth, that's the that's the way they, you know, get you hooked, right? But the minor truth that they're reporting are maybe. 10%, 20%, depending on the news agency, right? It's the poison that kills you, right? It's the poison that pollutes your mind. It's the poison that they feed you when they're feeding you accurate information 
that controls people. And that is the reason why we're going to read this article right here. The Art of Double Speak, Billing, can't, billing Cat and Mind Control. Really, this is incredibly important. When we say, when, when I say, and other people say, stop watching corporate mainstream news, it's not that we're saying that everybody's uninformed, that they, they don't know what's going on uh, and all that jazz. The reason we're saying it is because it is mind control, literally. By the way, uh, Kling Clock, uh, my tolerance on these streams regarding, uh, oh crap, how do I get rid of this? Oh, poop. <laughs> Let me do this. Uh, oh, I can do timeouts. Timeout, what happened? Oh, I can just kill this right here. That's the reason. Uh, I'm going to time you up, brother. Time out. I have no desire to deal with uh, uh, shill activity on this stream. That is for sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, doop. Let's go to the OPCW. I wish I knew how to keep the chat on top. Okay, not very sh chill, not very chill, and not very subtle about their things, right? Pop, pop. I remember when one of your mods timed me out accidentally. <laughs> Sorry, Wobbin. <laughs> Hopefully, my time out of uh, clink clunk was not uh, ac what do you call it, an accident, and he's okay. But uh, clink clunk. Uh, you can take that to Reddit if you want to talk about Julian Assange being a Russian shill because a lot of the politics news stuff on there is promoting that BS. OPCW Doma Docs. Top Viber would probably be. Okay. OPCW Doma Docs. Release Part 3, December 14th, 2019. OPCW release DOMA release part three. Okay. Today, WikiLeaks releases more documents showing internal disagreement within the OPCW about how facts were misrepresented in a redacted version of a report on an alleged chemical attack in DOMA, Syria in April 2018. Amongst these is a memorandum written in protest by one of the scientists sent sent on a fact-finding mission, FFM, to investigate the attack. It is dated 14 March 2019 and is addressed to Fernando Aries, Director General of the organization. This was exactly two weeks after the organization published its final report on the DOMA investigation. WikiLeaks is also releasing the original preliminary report for the first time along with the redacted version that was released by the OPCW for comparison. Additionally, we are publishing a detailed comparison of the original interim report with the redacted interim report and the final report along with relevant comments from a member of the original fact-finding mission. These documents should help clarify the series of changes that the report went through, which skewed the facts and introduced bias according to statements made by the members of the FM, FFM. The aforementioned memo states that around 20 inspectors have expressed concerns over the final FFM report, which they feel did, quote, did not reflect the views of the team members that deployed to DOMA, end quote. Only one member of the fact-finding team that went to DOMA, a paramedic, is said to have contributed to the final version of the report. Apart from that one person, an entirely new team was gathered to assemble the final report, referred to, refer, referred to as the FFM core team. This team was staffed with people who, quote, had only operated in country X, end quote. According to the memorandum, it is not uh, according to the memorandum. It is not clear what country that refers to, except that it is presumably not Syria. 
It is possible, though only speculation, that country X refers to Turkey as OPCW has sent teams into refugee camps there to inter interview survivors from Doma. The other the author of the memorandum states that he was the only originally tasked he was the one originally tasked with anal with analysis and assessment of the two cylinders found on the scene of the alleged chemical attack this was a task he undertook in the understanding he was clearly the most qualified team member having been to the location in doma and because of his expertise in metallurgy chemical engineering including pressure vessel design uh, artillery and defense r and r and d he continues in subsequent weeks i found that i was being excluded from the work for reasons not made clear the author explains that he had frequently asked to be updated on the progress of the final report and to be allowed to review the draft but was turned down on both counts the response was utmost secrecy once the final report was released on the 1st of march 2019 it became clear that the conclusion of the report had changed significantly in the hands of the new core team that assembled it into its final form at the conclusion of the in-country activities in the syrian arab republic the consensus within the ffm team was that there were indications of serious inconsistencies in findings after the exclusion of all team members other than a small cadre of members who had deployed and deployed and deployed again in october 2018 to country x the conclusion seems to have turned completely in the opposite direction the ffm team members find this confusing and are concerned to know how this occurred Towards the end of the memo, he writes, In conclusion, I must stress that I hold no opinion, interest, or strong view on the technical part of the matter, nor any interest in the political outcomes. My interest is in sound technical rigor. The science, engineering, and facts will speak for themselves. WikiLeaks is releasing supporting documents that back up these claims in great detail great technical detail including the original interim report and appraisal of the changes each iteration went through this is huge this is you mainstream news sources should be spending months on what wikileaks has released okay i'll state this again that is extremely extremely significant if they are not covering this information you are being propagandized okay. i'm just going to catch up with chat because what we're going to do now is we're going to watch this interview okay but uh let me get ca caught up with chat just in case there's any questions or anything but do you actually believe he's not funded by anyone da, 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 da. um who's that there was a bit of evidence that he was from a Jewish. To, to be honest, do they even need to fund him? As long as he targets USA, USA's rivals have nothing to lose. But he's, uh, are we talking about uh, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange? He's also in jail. Yeah, I, I'm assuming we are. WikiLeaks has released tremendous amount of information on countless countries. I'm pretty sure most centralized institutions, most centralized governments, want to see julian assange's head on a platter and they would love to see wikileaks shut down including shutting down other platforms organizations that have popped up since wikileaks came up to provide a platform for whistleblowers to release information those people that say wikileaks only releases information on the united states of the horrendous war crimes that the u.s has committed and stuff like this haven't really gone to the wikipedia or wikileaks page because WikiLeaks has released a tremendous amount of information on countless other countries and organizations. Okay. I mean, I just take that as an opinion. Speculation for sure. Hey, Chicho, good day to you. The Wayfaring Soul, how are you doing? And you know, they won't. Okay, cool. So that's me catching up with the chat. Let's, uh, before we get into our next reading, let's watch this 25 minute interview. Um, 
I would, you know, I was thinking about not showing or for us not to watch this whole interview, but I think it's worthwhile. Okay. Oops. So again, if the sound quality, if the sound is too loud, please let me know and I'll, uh, uh, I'll reduce the sound. And I think what I'm going to do is uh, make it, oops, I don't want to do that. I want to make this video, make it on the smaller thing. That way we can also have the chat up. What I mean is, you know that the mainstream media will not report this properly, if at all. Uh, agreed. Monkey farts, how are you doing? Boop, boop. Oh yeah, by the way, regarding these... Uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll give you guys all that updates later. Okay, I'll give you guys updates later. Should we start this video? Let's watch this video. And this is... Uh, here, let me provide the link in the chat as well. So if anyone's following this, well, you are following this. But if you want to bookmark this and... How's your weekend, Chicho? Mikey Forrest, going well, brother. Going well. Going well. So, let's do this. And uh, this is, uh, the title of this video is Newsweek Reporter Quits After Editor Blocks Coverage of OPCW Serious Scandal. And uh, the description for this is, uh, it's pushback by Aaron Matt, a journalist, uh, Tariq Haddad, explains his decision to resign from Newsweek over its refusal to cover the OPCW's unfolding serious scandal. According to the whistleblower testimony and leaked documents, OPCW officials raised alarm about the suppression of critical uh, findings that undermine the allegations that the Syrian government committed a chemical uh, weapons attack in the city of Doma in April 2018. Had that editors at Newsweek rejected his attempts to cover the story. Okay, and he's got a code here, but we're gonna read, we're gonna watch the whole thing and we'll take it from there. Okay, so 25 minute video gang. Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Mate. New leaks continue to expose a cover up by the OPCW, the world's top chemical weapons watchdog, over a critical event in Syria. Documents, emails, and testimony from OPCW officials have raised major doubts about the allegation that the Syrian government committed a chemical weapons attack in the city of Douma in April 2018. The leaked OPCW information has been released in pieces by WikiLeaks. The latest documents contain a number of significant revelations, including that about 20 OPCW officials voiced concerns to their superiors that their scientific findings and on-the-ground evidence was suppressed and excluded. This is, without a doubt, a major global scandal. The OPCW, under reported U.S. pressure, suppressing vital evidence about allegations of chemical weapons in Syria. But that very fact exposes another global scandal. With the exception of small outlets like the Grey Zone, the mass media has widely ignored or whitewashed this story. And this widespread censorship of the OPCW scandal has just led one journalist to resign. Up until recently, Tarek Haddad was a reporter at Newsweek. But in early December, Tarek announced that he had quit his position after Newsweek refused to publish his story about the OPCW cover-up. In a lengthy piece explaining his decision, Tarek writes, quote, On one hand, I could continue to be employed by the company, stay in their chic London offices, and earn a steady salary, only if I adhered to what could or could not be reported and suppressed vital facts. Alternatively, I could leave the company and tell the truth. Well, Tarek Haddad, he joins me now. Tarek Haddad, welcome to Pushback. Talk to us about what prompted your decision to resign and the events that led up to it. Sure, uh, and thank you for having me on. Um, yeah, basically, um, like I detail in my piece, um, you know, I wasn't kind of going into this situation with any any kind of, you know, in, intentions of you know making a big big controversy. Um, just doing my my job as a, as a news reporter, um, the situation in Syria starts to pick up again, <clears throat> um, and then alleged white phosphorus use by Turkey. So. You know, I'm starting to look at things going on with the OPCW as they're the body that is, you know, supposed to be investigating uh, attacks such as those. 
Um, and so it's just kind of snowballed out of there of, um, you know, I kept finding more and more information that, you know, to me, this was an undeniably big news story. Um, and, you know, everything in my, in my gut was, you know, there's something that needs to be printed about this. Um, I raised it with my editors and then, you know, got knocked back more and more. Um, and then with time, it became clear that it wasn't um, because my evidence wasn't good enough. Um, it was purely on a, you know, this, this story is not something that's, you know, in our interests to publish to our readers. <clears throat> so um, that was essentially it, really. You write in your piece, quote, the U.S. government, in an ugly alliance with those who profit the most from war, has its tentacles in every part of the media. Imposters with ties to the U.S. State Department sit in newsrooms all over the world. Editors with no apparent connections to the members club have done nothing to resist. Together, they filter out what can or cannot be reported. Inconvenient stories are completely blocked. As a result, journalism is quickly dying. America is regressing because it lacks the truth. So talk to us about that, Tark, and how you experience that in the newsroom, that dynamic in the newsroom, especially when it comes to reliance on sources with ties to war profiteers and Western governments themselves. Sure. Well, I guess um, there'll be sort of two different parts to that question, but um, I guess so one aspect is, is the the editors that have links to um, these organizations such as the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, and so, for example, in my time as working as a journalist, I was never aware of any kind of connection between journalism and the Council on Foreign Relations. And so that's kind of was my first ever real experience of it. And I, you know, say this in the piece because some people might think that I'm you know, being naive, and of course they have a massive influence on, on journalism, and it's been going for years, um, and that might be the case, but, you know, it was the first time I experienced it, and it was not something that I thought was appropriate for a newsroom. You know, I've been in multiple newsrooms, and, you know, someone who's been very big on kind of the history of journalism and the ethics of journalism, and... To me, that just seemed like a complete flagrant violation of everything that journalism stands for, to have people that, you know, attend, um, you know, programs funded by the State Department and, you know, they're making these these connections with people in the State Department. And then, you know, when I was presented with kind of the evidence that I experienced, um, it kind of confirmed my... my um, you know my feelings about that and then so the second part would be about yeah the reliance on um, organizations like Bellingcat which um, other journalists have taken the time to show that you know um, they're not who they purport to be um, and I think there's still a lot of work to be done around that because I think <clears throat> my understanding from the public is that um, a lot of people still still seem to trust them and just a kind of, you know, one tweet from them will be enough for an average reader that's not, um, you know, that's not taking the time to delve into these issues. It's usually enough for them to be, okay, this is, a, this is an issue that I can ignore now. Um, so I think that's another vital aspect because it's a very new development of, <clears throat> of propaganda that's, you know, not really been seen before, um, before Syria. Um, so... Yeah, well, I mean, Tarek... Let me just explain for people who aren't familiar with Bellingcat, because it's very important. Bellingcat is an organization of so-called citizen journalists uh, using open source data uh, that has become very prominent in recent years, and now they're relied on by the media uh, in, uh, in several major stories, especially when it comes to stories that accuse Russia or, Siri, uh, or Syria of nefarious acts, like a chemical weapons attack, and they've become to be used as a source and even though they, their, their founder, for example, uh, Elliot Higgins, I'll, I'll read you a quote. Uh, this is from the New York Times, where it, you know, they acknowledge that they don't even have a scientific background. I'll, I'll, I'll read this to you. Uh, Mr. Higgins... Or background. Or journal, or journal, right. But yeah. I'll read you a quote from the New York Times, for example, talking about the founder of Bell and Cat, Elliot Higgins. It says quote, this, quote, Mr. Higgins attributed his skill 
not to any special knowledge of international conflicts or digital data, but to the hours he had spent playing video games, which he said gave him the idea that any mystery can be cracked. Unquote. That's an actual quote from the New York Times, and somehow that's deemed to be a, uh, a boost uh, to them and not uh, shining a light on just how weak their credentials are, the very fact that they're playing video games and citing that as reason why, as how they've honed their craft. And what is also concealed uh, in how the mainstream media cites Bellingcat is that Bellingcat receives funding from the National Endowment for Democracy, which is a U.S. government uh, body and has been used to advance regime change goals around the world. Elliot Higgins himself is a uh, fellow at the Atlantic Council, which is funded by all sorts of governments, including the U.S., Britain, and members of NATO and the uh, Gulf states. And yet they're uh, used and cited often as experts. And what's interesting about this OPCW scandal is there has been a lot of concern that in fact the OPCW, in ignoring its own scientists and sidelining them, that they relied on Bellingcat. And because a lot of the findings that were in uh, some final OPCW reports have mirrored Bellingcats. And there's a reference in uh, the suppressed engineering report, the one that the public was not meant to see. We can talk more about that. But this engineering expert at the OPCW, uh, the, w the one where, which concludes that actually he thinks that most likely the gas cylinders found at the scene in Duma were manually placed and not dropped from the air. But that, that expert, his report refers to, quote, supposed experts who the OPCW consulted. And that has been their speculation that those supposed experts, that this actual expert is referring to, is Bellingcat. Right. And I guess that would mirror a similar trend that we saw with MH17, which, um, you know, um, I can't remember the, the U.S. official that said so, but I think um, if you um, look on my Twitter, there's an article recently from kind of describing the history of Bellingcat, but... U.S. officials directly kind of almost thank Bellingcat for their investigative work um, in determining their results. So I think it's it's, um, it's part of this very kind of nefarious strategy of saying, you know, it's almost, you know, you're praising Bellingcat and then you're accept they're accepting their results unquestioningly. And then people who, uh, you know, differ from that narrative um, you know, get silenced, and, uh, and that's why we have this situation that we have at the moment, where you know, genuine scientists with no real political interest. Um, you know, I've, I've talked, I've talked to some people in this industry when I was pre uh, researching previous articles. Um, you know, most of them aren't really political; they're they're engineers or so on, and they're just and they, you know, they they understand the gravitas of their job. Um, they understand, you know, that their job isn't to be political, it's to, you know, just do their best job they can as scientists and then let the dust falls where, where it does afterwards. So, and I think that's why it's such an important story as well, because it's, it's so dangerous to, to politicize a body that, like this. Um, you know, these bodies were put in place for very, very important reasons um, and to avoid, you know, devastating um, attacks against human beings that shouldn't be kind of going on in this in this day and age and if we start to politicize them and we undermine their authority then um, it's very dangerous I think and that should go without saying and since since, since you referred to it just let me explain uh, what MH17 is for anybody who doesn't know that is the downing of Malaysia Airlines flight uh, 17 that occurred in the summer of 2014 and Bellingcat was among the groups that accused uh, or pointed the finger at Russian-backed separatists in Ukraine uh, as having carried out that attack. But of course, that conclusion of Bellingcat's, like many others, has come under question. But talk, tell us more about your struggles internally at Newsweek, um, and you know your efforts to try to resolve whatever objections you faced in trying to cover this story about the OPCW scandal in Syria? Sure. Um, so, kind of, it started off no different than any other news story that I would pitch. Um, uh, we have a messaging system called Slack, which I think a lot of people are familiar with, but um, 
yeah, first I raised it with uh, one of my editors, Alfred Joyner, um, and you know he's he didn't seem to be particularly opposed to the story, but you know he's not um, he doesn't have particular expertise in foreign affairs or anything like that. So it was automatically um, I was told to write a note to him and and um, Demi Ryder, which is our foreign affairs editor at Newsweek. Um, you know, I sent a long, longish note with, you know, with links, various documents to support what um, what was going on. Um, interestingly, almost kind of five minutes after I sent the note, I, I kind of wasn't expecting a response immediately. Um, and I was just walking to get a cup of coffee and immediately, um, you know, I could start to see attempts to kind of not, um, you know, to cast doubt over the story. Um, and it, but it was the kind of stuff that's it's not addressing the actual facts it's kind of oh you know the, the publication itself where these things come from you know that's a little bit suspect even though it was the mail on Sunday um, I understand for political reasons some people might disapprove of the politics of the mail on Sunday um, they tend to be more right wing um, in, the, in the United Kingdom but um, you know, journalists trained in the United Kingdom will know that the Mail on Sunday still has very good journalists, and you know they exposed the um, 2005 MPs expenses scandal, for example. Um, so it's not like they're incapable of doing real journalism. And then I had people have raised doubts about Peter Hitchens, who's the person that wrote the Mail on Sunday piece, um, and because he's kind of spent the last few years as an opinion columnist. Um, but again, I kind of went to great lengths to try and explain, listen, I understand his his recent history and why he might be controversial to some figures, um, but he has a very, very long, uh, you know, reporting career, um, was Washington Bureau and a Moscow Bureau for about 20 years, um, and, you know, he takes the time in his reporting to, to kind of, um, to show how everything's been, you know, done and verified and there's been kind of blog posts to the side that have documented how he's met with one of the OPCW scientists in a safe house in Europe. Um, so it was kind of my immediate feeling is that the the facts of what I was presenting weren't being discussed. It was attacking the sources or who it's coming from. And then when I kept pushing, 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 essentially um, it turned into a character attack of me. Um, and that was, you know, the moment that I was became very kind of upset and essentially decided to resign because um, kind of without being over kind of overconfident in my abilities or egotistical or anything of that nature but throughout my um, reporting career I've, I've never really had any issues of um, editors not getting on with me or um, you know saying that my sources are not very good or anything like that and that's even though I understand the piece I've written may be very difficult and long for people to get to get through, I just really wanted to explain that, you know, I have this um, journalism background. I've never had all the, any issues before. It was only when I was starting to raise questions about, you know, things that the U.S. government essentially wouldn't want answered that I started having these character attacks. Um, and it was, it did feel pretty much like bullying into, you know, just be quiet, do, you know, do the kind of reporting we want you to do and don't question don't question us if we say that you can't run this story. Um, and this is kind of, it was funny because at the time, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, we had the firing of a reporter um, who kind of ran this um, story that turned out to be wrong about Donald Trump um, a week before. So she quit because she said Donald Trump was, uh, you know, what's Donald Trump doing on Thanksgiving? He's going to be tweeting, golfing and more. Turns out he makes a visit to Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, at the time, you know, this was actually happening at the same time as the OPCW thing. At the time, you know, we were having lots of team meetings and the editors are saying, you know, I understand if you guys are concerned, you know, please come and talk to us. We're always here to have questions. You know, if you, um, if you have questions on a story, feel free to question our judgment. That kind of, you know, those kind of messages. And at the same time, I was going to the editors. I was raising some of my concerns. And essentially, they refused to speak to me. Um, you know, I made three attempts to speak to Laura Davis, the London editor, um, and I was getting, you know, increasingly more stressed because 
I really wanted to, I thought it was a very important story and I was getting this, this criticism at the time from the editors um, and I really just wanted to talk to her in person um, to share my concerns and you know discuss why I thought it was an important story and then the next thing I know I receive an email you know that's fairly long just listing out criticisms so that was when I knew it wasn't um, you know this wasn't on rational debate or something wrong with the facts or the facts not matching up it you know there was an ulterior motive here and so talk to us then about your decision to resign and did you think through what the consequences were of quitting this position and, and whether you how this would impact your ability to find another position in a media industry where obviously jobs are are, 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 are already very scarce and hard to find mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, to be honest, um, if, I, if I don't find another position in, in journalism because of this, I'm perfectly happy to accept that consequence. I mean, it's not desirable, but there is no way I could have continued in that job um, knowing that I'd have to, you know, I, that I couldn't report something like this. Um, it was actually a very, I remember because so I was thinking about resigning for about a week in that time that I was um, collecting evidence and I was talking hoping to talk to Laura um, and they but when I received that email that kind of was essentially a character attack it, the decision became very easy um, because it kind of it clarified everything for me um, and to be honest I, I don't regret it at all um, I still don't know where the chips are going to fall essentially from here but um you know, so far the feedback from everyone's been fantastic. Um, the support from the internet um, has been really great. I'm very thankful to people that have, you know, said kind things to me. And thankfully, um, there's been very, very little negative. Um, you know, there's been a few, um, the kind of the usual people that you would expect, the Elliot Higgins and um, what's his name, David, Dave Lucas, I think, or some. Um, but you know, that's. But that's nothing to me. It's um, I don't really take what they say seriously, and um, and I don't think other people on the internet should anymore. We kind of know who they are, and I think um, people that kind of get into these long Twitter tirades with them is it's kind of going to be a waste of your time. You know what their job is to do. Um, they're not going to change their minds on the internet. That's that's not what they're there for. Um, they have a specific purpose, I think. What to you would be the best outcome of your ordeal here of what you went through, your choosing to resign, and you choosing to come forward to tell your story? So I think a couple of things. Um, one thing I tried to do is um, keep in mind other journalists when I was writing this. I, I, even though I'm not aware of any other journalists in a similar position, um, I sh I'm definitely sure that I can't be the only one. I mean, the amount of evidence that there is at the moment kind of surrounding these OPCW leaks is growing by the day. Um, it's becoming harder and harder for any serious journalist to kind of look at the evidence and, you know, continue with the same thing. Um, so I think one ideal scenario would be that other journalists start to push the issue with their respective organizations. Um, and, you know, hopefully we, we do start seeing some coverage. Even though I'm very critical of Newsweek in the piece that I've written, um, I think what happened to me could have happened to any publication uh, in the West, you know, uh, except a, a, a very few. Um, so I think, yeah, that's one thing. Hopefully other journalists will start to speak up. Um, more long term, I, I mean, I don't know if this is very naive, but I'd love to see the influence of um, the CFR, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, have a, you know, that journalists say no actually you have a conflict of interest you don't have a, a place in a newsroom you know there is no space for you you have a you know this you can't do your job adequately to hold the government to account that's the journalists you know one of the journalists main priorities if you have this conflict of interest sorry it makes you um, not not applicable to be a journalist um, and then I guess finally just to, um, greater public awareness about uh, how propaganda works um, and it's not just Bellingcat I think um, 
I think there's a lot of evidence to say that white helmets as well is is propaganda um, and that might have been a controversial thing to say a few years ago but I think now it's you know the, the evidence is there that it's beyond doubt that it's government propaganda um, and I think people just slowly need to get you know get more awareness about that out well Tar. I, for one, uh, I'm one of the many who really appreciates what you've done here. Uh, it takes a lot to not just speak out about Syria, which I think is actually brave in itself, given all the smear attacks that one faces. But in your case, you risk your job over it, and you, and you lost your job over it, and you resigned in a very principled move. And so I, for one, uh, hope that your integrity and your courage will resonate and inspire other media outlets and journalists to display uh, that same uh, integrity and courage that you've shown here. And, and I, I, I hope that it will, because this is often how whistleblowing works and how truth-telling works, is it takes one brave person to set a chain in motion. And I really hope that that is what happens here. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, um, that's, that's all I can hope for, really. Um, you know, I, I had... Um, you know, parents and stuff on the phone, and various people that I've worked through with through the years. Um, some of with some of which are, you know, have experience of these things, and a lot of people kind of actually, you know, told me not to do this. Um, some people worried for my safety. Obviously, my parents were a little bit concerned. Um, you know, given that kind of it's not out of the ordinary for for kind of nefarious things to happen in these situations. Um, but you know, I think it was it was the important you know it was the right thing to do, and I don't have any regrets. And hopefully, more and more people can start to talk about it. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of good journalists out there. Um, the evidence is there. It's you know they, and I'm sure there's definitely other people that are feeling frustrated. So hopefully, I've given them the template of how they can approach editors and how they can raise stories and how they can push back if. Um, you know, if they are kind of, uh, you know, their stories are declined. And hopefully that's a trend. I hope so, too. Uh, Tarek Haddad is a journalist, up until recently a reporter at Newsweek. And his website is Tarek Haddad. And we'll link to his piece where he breaks down uh, his reporting process about this Syria OPCW scandal and what led him to resign from Newsweek. Tarek, thanks very much. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. I wanted to make sure we watch that video because there are good journalists out there that are independent as well as some that are working for certain news agencies that are trying to report what's going on in the world, how important this is. But they're being either shut down, fired. And if you want an example of one person, highest level person that you can think of that was prevented from reporting on what they were finding, right? Look at Phil Donahue and Sleepy Waves. You asked a question, which is uh, Chicho, I'm confused on what this leakage really means. Let me link it up to the Iraq war, that the Iraq invasion, one called the war, is a war of aggression, right? It's a war crime, and it was an invasion of Iraq. Okay, and the invasion of Iraq was done under the pretense that Iraq had weapons of mass destruct destruction, chemical weapons that they could use at any time. And the Western world was riled up to a fear level that you, if you didn't live through that period, you cannot even imagine the, the, the insanity that people were in, right? They, they actually believed corporate propaganda mainstream news that was coming out and their politicians representing institutions in the background that wanted to wage war as to why they had to go and invade iraq and all of it has come out over the last 15 years that it was all based on lies all of it all of it all of it right and if we're living in just times all of those people that started the Iraq invasion and continued the Iraq invasion that has resulted in hundreds of thousands of murders, 
right and tens of millions of refugees being created and all this jazz that had a domino effect into syria into yemen into turkey into iran into libya and all this jazz right they would be on trial for war crimes right your question sleepy wave chicho i'm confused on what this leakage really means phil donahue was the you could call him a journalist but you you could say he was the longest running he had the longest running um television talk show broadcast in us it started in the 1960s and in 2002 2003 he was fired because he was the only voice on western mainstream media that was opposing the iraq invasion that he was bringing on guests and sharing information that was saying hey iraq doesn't have weapons of mass destruction this is a lie we're going into war for a lie and i don't know which station he was in abc nbc or whatever it was they fired him they took the longest running television show in the united states off air because the host of that show was presenting information that went against what the government propagandists were sharing that was getting people to support the war in iraq okay link that up to what the opcw opcw doma docs represent these this organization the organization for the provincial pre prevention um, um, of chemical weapons okay is a global watchdog supposedly manned by scientists unbiased that go into regions where there has been reported that chemical weapons have been used or they're doing weapons inspections and whatnot to figure out if chemical weapons have been used or if any country or institution is creating chemical weapons to be used somewhere right they're basically the watchdog global watchdog and it's come out that this global watchdog has been compromised and the report that they released about syria did not contain information that their scientists had shared and they actually in this report we find out that the scientists that they sent to investigate the chemical attack in syria there was 20 of them or something they were all pulled from the case and a new group was put in to write the report to blame syria for the chemical attack so instead of using just mainstream corporate propaganda to start another invasion in the middle east they actually co-opted the war machine the opcw global watchdog to put out a fake report okay that went against their own inspectors findings to start another invasion to start another war in syria that's how big this thing is it's huge and if you look at the if you go back and you read some of the leaks i believe it's three leaks from washington post that they put out regarding the afghanistan papers then the last since the invasion of afghanistan u.s officials have lied about everything that is going on in afghanistan who they are allies with where the money is going that they're supposedly winning that they're winning the hearts and minds they're building infrastructure that all their generals and politicians and majors or whatever they all think they're doing great they just need more funding it's come out that in the last 18 years all three administrations bush jr obama and trump have been lying to the american people and that has resulted in hundreds of thousands of people dying millions of refugees being created i believe it's over five or six trillion dollars being wasted in afghanistan right by a war machine this should be front page news because this is also connected to the doma opcw doma report okay that's the general gist the quick uh recap of what this means okay misleading the public about justification for war is of course a bad thing but it is not a war crime wars of aggressions are war crimes post-apocalypse the invasion of iraq was a war of aggression and it is a war crime okay 
I think we should not conflate various negative things together because clarity in definition is important for understanding. 100% agree uh, post-apocalypse. But the invasion of Iraq, as far as I've looked into it, was a war of aggression, and a war of aggression is a war crime. Okay, I thought that the Washington Post was corporate media. Why would they put this article out? Exactly. That's, a, that's something that a lot of people have been talking about. There's word that because Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos, Amazon, where we're twitching, where we're live streaming right now through Twitch, is owned by Amazon, which is Jeff Bezos. And Trump has been saying that they're going to go after Amazon, right? In the first term in his presidency, he's been putting it out there that Amazon needs to be controlled, broken up, or whatever for tax evasion, whatever it is, right? I don't really listen to Trump too much, but I know that he's been going after Jeff Bezos and Amazon. I don't think he means it, but Jeff Bezos owns Washington Post. And some people are saying this, this information was being leaked because it was supposed to give a black eye to Trump because he was coming out and saying, we're doing great in Afghanistan or whatnot. A war of aggression is not a war crime. War crimes are things you do during war. Are you, are we sure about this? I'll have to look into this. War of aggression, war crime. Uh, thanks for seconding that, seconding that uh, Dante. Thanks for bringing it up post-apocalypse and for the second Dante. I'll have to look into this after the stream. Okay. Crossing fingers for no second uh, term. Uh, monkey farts, I think he's in. Okay. I think uh, there is no uh, if I was a betting man because if you're betting what is a war of aggression war of aggression is uh, example of war crimes uh, a war of aggression is basically um, one nation threatening another nation and threatening a nation with annihilation which the United States has done multiple times is I believe under the umbrella of a war crime if I'm not mistaken, okay? But basically, it's another nation starting a war with another nation without cause, invading them, bombing them, right? For whatever reason they give. Examples of war crimes include intentionally killing civilians or prisoners, torturing, destroying civilian property, taking hostages, performing a uh, per perfidy, raping, and using uh, child soldiers, uh, pillaging, declaring that no quarter will be given, and seriously violating the principles of uh, distinction and uh, proportionality and military necessity. Under Nuremberg principles, war of regression are considered crimes against peace. Oh, that's what it is. Crimes against peace, which are distinct from war crimes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, post-apocalypse. Crimes against peace. Okay, Because the Nuremberg stuff is what I've read in the past. And I read those stuff a while ago, right? And I get my terminology mixed up. So it's a crime against peace. I've never heard the term war crimes used for uh, unjustified wars. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Maybe it's, it's uh, what do you call it? Uh, crime against peace. I'll have to read that stuff again. My apologies if I'm getting my terminology mixed and I'm getting riled up, but I don't pretend to be a journalist and I'm not pretending to be unbiased in this. But that's not justification for me sharing uh, misinformation, disinformation, fallacies, right? Because I'm wrong. It is common to confuse these terms. Yeah, I have. I have. Crime against peace. Okay. Cool. So, gang, should we do a reading of this article? Edward Curtin's Behind the Curtain. Okay. And this guy is, uh, let me read, read you his about page so you know who this guy is. Okay. Uh, educated in the classics, philosophy, literature, theology, and sci uh, sociology, I teach sociology at Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. My writing on various topics has appeared widely over many years. I write as a public intellectual for the general public not as a specialist for a narrow readership. I believe a non-committal sociology is an impossibility and therefore see all my work as an effort to enhance human freedom through understanding. I like this guy. Right. Nice intro. He is not pretending to be anything else other than 
what he says he is. And this is, uh, you know, you can go older posts down here, right? But I guess he's written a fair bit, maybe. Uh, but I checked out, I've read a couple of his pieces and I like them. And this is the one that really caught my attention. Okay. So. The U.S. also committed war. Yeah, the U.S. has committed war crimes. Treme num tremendous number of war crimes. Take a shot every time you see curtain. You see curtain. <laughs> okay, let's read this. Now, this is a long piece, gang. We've got about 35 minutes. I'm going to try to get through this whole thing. Uh, we should be able to. Okay. Uh, and I'll leave the chat open. Uh, so, and I'll, let me provide the link in the description. Uh, in the chat as well, just in case you guys want to keep track of what it is that we're reading and doing. The Art of Doublespeak, Billing Cat and Mind Control. In the 1920s, the influential American intellectual Walter Lippmann argued that the average person was incapable of seeing or understanding the world clearly and needed to be guided by experts behind the social curtain. In a number of books, he laid out the theore uh, theoretical foundations for the practical work of Edward Bernays, who developed public relations, a.k.a. propaganda, to carry out this task for the ruling elite. Bernays had honed his skills while working as a propagandist for the United States during World War I, and after the war, he set himself up as a public relations counselor in New York City. There is a fascinating exchange at the beginning of Adam Curtis's documentary, The Century of the Self, where Bernays, then nearly 100 years old, but still very sharp, reveals his manipulative mindset and that of so many of those who have followed in his wake. He says the reason he couldn't call his new business propaganda was because the Germans had given propaganda a bad name. And so he came up with the in euphorism public relations. He then adds that if you can see it, i.e. propaganda for war, you certainly could use it for peace. Of course, he never used PR for peace, but just to manipulate public opinion. He helped engineer the CIA coup against the democratically elected Arben, Arben's government in Guatemala in 1954 with fake news broadcasts. He says the Germans gave propaganda a bad name, not Bern Bernies and the United States with their vast campaign of lies mainly aimed at the American people to get their support for going to war they opposed. Think weapons of mass destruction. He sounds proud of his propaganda work that res resounded to his credit, uh, to his credit since it led to support for the war to end all wars and subsequently to hit a movie about World War I, Yankee Doodle Dandy, made in 1942 to promote another war since the first one somehow didn't achieve its lofty goal. As Bernese had said in his book Propaganda, the American motion picture is the greatest unconscious carrier of propaganda in the world today. He was a propagandist to the end. I suspect most viewers of the film are taken in by those softly spoken words of an old man sipping a glass of wine at a dinner table with a woman who is asking him questions. I have shown this film to hundreds of students and none has noticed the, his leaguer demeanor leaguer the mean it is an example of the sort of hocus pocus i will be getting to shortly the sly insertion into seemingly liberal or matter of fact commentary of statements that's simply a different story the placement of convincing uh, the placement of convincing or confusing disingenuous in ingredients into a true sandwich for bernese knew that the bread of truth is essential to conceal untruth. In the following years, Bernese, Lipman, and their ilk were joined by social scientists, psychologists, and sundry 
others intent on making a sham out of the idea of democracy by developing strategies and techniques for the engineering of, of social consensus cons consonant with the wishes of the ruling classes their techniques are their techniques of propaganda developed exponentially with the development of technology the creation of the cia its infiltration of all the major media and that agencies court courting of what the cia official cord meyer called in the 1950s the compatible left having already had the right right in its pocket today most people are as is said wired and they get their information from the electronic media that is mostly controlled by giant corporations in cahoots with government propagandas ask yourself has the power of the oligarch permanent warfare state with its propaganda and spy networks increased or decreased over your lifetime the answer is obvious the average person the average people that Lipman and Bernice trashed are losing and the ruling elites are winning this is not just because powerful propagandists are good at controlling so-called average people's thinking but perhaps more importantly because they are also adept probably more so at confusing or directing the thinking of those who consider themselves above average those who still might read a book or two or have the concentration to read multiple articles that offer different perspectives on topic on a topic this is what some call the professional and intellectual classes perhaps 15 to 20 percent of the population most of most of whom are not the ruling elite but their employees and sometimes their mouthpieces it is this segment of the population that considers itself informed but the information they Im imbibe is often sprinkled with bits of this misdirection both in intentional and not that be clouds their understanding of important public matters but leaves them with the false impression that they are in the know recently i have noticed a group of in interconnected examples of how this group of the population that exerts influence in com commercial commercial rate with their numbers has contributed to the blurring of lines between fact and fiction within this group there are opinion makers who are often journalists writers and cultural producers and of some sort or another and then the larger number of the intellectual or school class who follow their opinions this second group then passes on their deceived opinions to those who look up to them there is a notorious propaganda outfit called billing cat started by an unemployed englishman named elliot higgins that has been funded by the atlantic council a think tank with deep ties to the u.s government nato war manufacturers and their allies and the national endowment for democracy ned another infamous u.s front organization heavily involved in so-called color revolution regime change operations all around the world that has just won the international emmy award for best documentary the film with the orwellian title bellingcat truth is a post-truth world truth in a post-truth world received this emmy at a recent ceremony in the in new york city bellingcat is an alleged group of amateur online researchers who have spent years shilling for the u.s in in instigated war against the syrian government claim blaming the doma chemical attack and other others on the assad government and for the anti-russian propaganda connected to among other things the sp sprip uh, sprip ripple poisoning case in england at the downing of flight mh17 plane in ukraine it has been lauded by the corporate mainstream media in the west its support for the equally fraudulent white helmets also funded by the us and uk in syria has also been praised by the western corporate media while being dis dissected as propaganda by many excellent independent journalists such as eva bartlett vanessa Beely, kate black among others 
is had his work skewed by the likes of Seymour Hirsch and MIT professor Theodore Postel and its U.S. government connections pointed out by many others, including Ben Norton and Max B Blumenthal at the Gray Zone. And now we have mainstream media's wall of silence on the leak from the Organization for a Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, OPCW, concerning the Doma chemical attack and the doctoring of the report that led to the illegal U.S. bombing of Syria in the spring of 2018. Billing Cat was at the forefront of providing justification for such bombing. And now the journalist Peter Hitchens, Tariq Harad, who recently resigned from Newsweek after accusing the publica publication of suppressing his revelations about the OPCW scandal, and others are fighting an uphill battle to get the truth out. Yet Bellingcat, truth is a post in a post-truth world, won the Emmy, fulfilling Bernice's point about films being the greatest consciousness carriers, unconscious carriers of propaganda in the world today. Who presents the Emmy Award to the filmmakers, but none other than the rebel journalist Chris Hedges? Why he did so, I don't know. But that he did so clearly sends a message to those who follow his work and trust him that it's okay to give a major culture award to a propaganda outfit. But then perhaps he doesn't cons consider Bellingcat to be that. Nor one presumes does The Intercept, the billionaire Pierre Omdeyar, own publication associated with Grant Glenn Greenwald and Jeremy Scahill, and also read by many progressive-minded people. The Intercept, that earlier this year disbanded the small team that was tasked with reviewing and releasing more of the massive trove of documents they received from Edward Snowden six years ago. A minute number a minute number of which have ever been a minute number of which have ever been released or probably ever will be as whitney webb pointed out last year the intercept hosted a workshop for bellingcap she wrote quote the intercept along with his parent company first look media recently hosted a workshop for pro-war google funded organization bellingcat in new york the workshop, which cost $2,500 per person to attend and lasted five days, aimed, aimed to inst instruct uh, participants into how to perform investigations using open source tools. With Billingcat's past controversial investigations for use as a case study, thus while The Intercept has long publicly promoted itself as an in anti interventionist and progressive media outlet it has become clear clearer that largely thanks to its ties to omia the omidyar it is increasingly or an organization that has more in common with bellingcat a bellingcat a group that launders nato and u.s propaganda and disguises it as independent and investigative journalism end quote then we have Jefferson Morley, the editor of the Deep State, former Washington Post journalist and JFK assassination researcher who has written a praiseworthy review of the Bellingcat film and who supports Bellingcat. Quote, in my experience, Bellingcat is incredible. End quote. He writes in an Atlantic article, quote, Bellingcat documentary has the pace and plot of a thriller. End quote. Morley has also just written an article for Counterpunch, why the Doma chemical attack wasn't a, managed, wasn't a managed massacre, in which he disputes the claim that the April 17, 2018 attack in the Damascus suburb was a false flag operation carried out by Assad's opponents. Quote, I do not see any evidence proving that Doma was a false flag incident, end quote. He writes in his article in this article that it is written in a style that leaves one guessing as to what exactly he is saying. It sounds convincing unless one concentrates and then his double messages emerge. Yet it is the kind of article that certain sophisticated left wing readers might read and feel feel is insightful. But then Morley, who has 
written considerably about the CIA, edits a website that advertises itself as the thinking person's portal to the world of secret governments, and recently had an exchange with former CIA director John Brennan, where Brennan put a friendly finger on my chest, said in February 2017, less than a month after Trump was sworn in as president, that, quote, with a docile Republican majority in Congress and a uh, demoralized Democratic Party in opposition, the leaders of the deep state are the most, perhaps the only, credible check in Washington on what Senator Bob Corker, Republican Tennessee, calls Trump's wrecking ball presidency, end quote. Is it any wonder that some people might be a bit confused? I know what you're thinking about, said uh, Tweedledum, but it's it isn't so no how contrawise continued to it it is it if it was so it might be and if it were so it would be but it is it isn't it ain't that's logic okay as a final case in point there is a recent book by stephen kinzer poison poisoners in chief sydney Gobleet and the CIA search for mind control, the story of the chemist known as Dr. Death, who ran the CIA's MK Ultra Mind Control Project using LSD, torture, electric shock therapy, hypnosis, etc. The developed sadistic methods of torture still used in black sites around the world and invented various in ingenious techniques for assassination, many of which were many of which were aimed at Fidel Castro. Gottlieb, Gottlieb was responsible for brutal poison and hospital experiments and untold death and suffering inflicted on all sorts of innocent people. His work was depraved in the deepest sense. He worked with Nazis who experimented on Jews despite being Jewish himself. Kenzer writes in depth about this man who considers himself a patriot and a spiritual person a humane torturer and killer it is an eye-opening book for anyone who does not know about Gottlieb who gave the CIA the essential tools they use in their organized crime activities around the world in the words of Douglas Valentine the author of the CIA is organized crime and the, the author of the CIA as organized crime and the Phoenix program Kinzer's book is good history on Guttel, Guttlib. However, he doesn't venture into the present activities of the CIA and Guttlib's patriot, patriotic followers, who no doubt exist and go about their business in secret. After recounting in detail the sordid history of Guttlib's secret work that is nauseating to read about, Kenzer leaves the reader with these strange words, quote, Gut Gutlieb was not a sadist, but he might well have been. Above all, he was an instrument of history. Understanding him is a deeply disturbing way of understanding ourselves. End quote. What possibly could this mean? Not a sa sa sadist, an instrument of history, understanding ourselves. These few sentences dropped out of nowhere, pulled the rug out from under what is generally an illuminating history and what seems like a moral indictment in indictment this language is pure mystification kinzer also concludes that because gottlieb said so the cia failed in their efforts to develop minds of uh, methods of mind control and ended mk ultra's experiments long ago why would he believe the word of a man who who personifies the agency he worked for, a secret liar. He writes, quote, when Sidney Gottlieb brought MK Ultra to its end in the early 1960s, he told his CIA superiors that he had found no reliable way to wipe away memory, make people abandon their consciousness, or commit crimes and then forget them. As for those who might think otherwise, Kenzer suggests that uh, Kenzer, Kenzer suggests they have vivid imaginations and are caught up in a conspiracy, conspiracy thinking. Quote, 
think convincing others that the CIA had developed methods of mind control when they hadn't. It si uh, hadn't is Sidney Guttelbert's most unexpected legacy, end quote. He also, he, he asserts, he says this although Richard Helms, the CIA director, destroyed all MK Ultra records. He says that Alan Dulles, Gutlib, and Helms themselves were caught up in a complete fantasy about mind control because they had seen too many movies and read too many books. Mind control was impossible, a failure, a myth, he maintains. It is the stuff of popular culture, entertainment. In an interview with Chris Hedges, interestingly posted by Jefferson Morley at his website, The Deep State, Hedges agrees with Kinzer. Gottlieb, Dulles, et al. were all deluded. Mind control was impossible. You couldn't create a Manchurian candidate. By implication, someone by, by implication, someone like Shirhan Shirhan could not have been programmed to be a fake Manchurian candidate and to have no memory of what he said, as he claims. He could not have been mind controlled by the CIA to perform this uh, his part as the seeming assassin of Senator John F. Kennedy, uh, uh, Senator Robert Kennedy, while the real killer shot JFK from behind. People who think this should get real. Furthermore, as is so common in books such as Kel Kenzer's, he repeats the canard that JFK and RFK knew about and pressured the CIA to assassinate Fidel Castro. This, this is demonstrably false, as shown by the Church Committee and the Assassination Record Review Board, among others, that Kenzer takes the word of notorious liars like Richard Helms and the top-level CIA operative Samuel Halpern in simple, uh, is simple incredible, something that is hard to consider a mistake slipped into a truth sandwich it is devoured and passed on but it is false bullshit meant to deceive but this is how how these games are played if you look carefully you will see them widely inform enlighten while throwing in double talk and untruth the small number of people who read such books and articles will come away knowing some history that has no current relevance and being misinformed on other history that does they will they will then be in the know ready to pass their wisdom on to those who who care to listen they will not think they are average but they will be mind controlled and the killer cat will roam freely without a bell ready to devour the un unsuspecting mice okay and that's the end of the article and by the way this book that he's talking about uh, revealing information of how the cia was using uh basically uh, uh what was his name uh, uh as a final case in point there's a recent book by stephen kilsner the book by stephen kilsner that was referencing gottelberg what he his experiments with the cia that he was jewish that he uh helped to torture jews during all this jazz and created all these ultra mk ultra and it's horrendous this interview we watched on contact with chris hedges right and remember i personally love chris hedges however i don't agree with everything he has to say and in this case we found out i didn't know about this but chris hedges i had read this article before but when i read this article i found out that chris hedges had given an award to bellingcat right i'm pretty sure he regrets it now and he will regret it um so i just wanted to read this article to you guys because it touches on many things that we have talked about in the past okay I'm just going to read some uh, chat that was put up, put up here. Uh, propaganda uh, in the past was seen as a form of marketing by governments. During World War II, this is post-apocalypse, uh, during World War II, um, it was used by all major powers to maintain public support for the war. Now it is a form of conflict, uh, form of conflict by competing multinational interests 
interested in influence that is usually unrelated to war i would say post-apocalypse a lot of a lot of propaganda it's gone beyond the i think corporations were really the first ones that well i guess governments corporate governments started using them but for sure corporations are using it to sell products influence people social engineer but so are governments to promote propaganda as far as i see it china is investing heavily in hollywood films and exerting influence to change content to align with a with an approved message for example 100 percent agree where is the drifting off topic uh where is this drifting off into this is the basically dante the reason i thought this article was fantastic because it links up uh for me my experience just talking with people regarding what's going on in syria and the chemical attacks at the time that they were occurring and even go back further to the first gulf war and second gulf war it blows my mind that people are so in general the public gets so riled up so manipulated into supporting war right sending their children to go die for corporations and resources and for the military industrial complex and this article was an amazing little piece i thought regarding how people are mind controlled really programmed propagandized into their acceptance of war this seems like a rambling document linking unrelated instances i don't think they're unrelated post-apocalypse chris hedges not looking good i want to see uh billing can just to see if i am mind control <laughs> yeah sleepy waves uh i might uh i might sample it off the internet and take a look at it to see what it's about what do you know about uh sydney uh, uh, gotelberg sydney gotelberg here's the on contact um let's go on contact uh, chris hedges here if we go here to on contact on chris hedges this is the interview that uh da, 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 this guy okay on contact cia research for mind control with stephen kisser if you guys are interested in what was uh being discussed in part of that have a look through this oops have a look through or watch this interview is very pff, tremendous amount of information right historically saying what the cia was doing to people kidnapping people off the streets and taking them to secret sites and torturing them and then killing them in the and mansions there are, they had mansions in europe and different parts of the world where they bring people there conduct experiments on them in their rooms right for months if not years and then once they had totally shattered their minds they would take them out the back and shoot them and bury them in the yard right unbelievable holy camoles right but as this document as this article mentions by edward Curtin, in the conclusion of this it says okay mk ultra was brought to an end but it hasn't been brought to an end torture hasn't brought been brought to an end we know that as a fact right so that's the thing that is linking up there's a lot of truth there but the conclusions might be flawed right yeah but what does this have to do uh with the mk ultra program the mk ultra program i think that's connecting up to a larger picture that through mass media through hollywood through what we consume as information we are all being mk ultra really even me even you because we are exposed to our society in this way we are constantly being bombarded right mind control is part of the whole social engineering of centralized institutions that is a given and we should always remember that jacoby hey chicho how you been my friend my man doing well jacoby thank you very much this article just summed up all the liberals who lead read the new york times and believe they know more better than the general joe sleepy waves agreed and i wouldn't yeah i thought the article said kinzer was shielding the truth truth i and by the way do i believe that kinzer um stephen kinzer was shielding the truth intentionally no i think it's just his conclusions that he does not believe that 
this stuff was continuing or MK he believes that MK Ultra were brought to an end and all this jazz right um, so some of the stuff and I think the article implies that that it's not conscious it's unconscious right the main thing that we have to do is what WikiLeaks and Julian Assange and whistleblowers and many other journalists have always told us to do question everything especially information coming from centralized institutions okay greetings fellow brothers my dolls how are you doing mk ultra was not about everyday pro uh, propaganda a uh, dante uh, maybe not but it has definitely uh, gone there mk ultra was about mind control is about controlling the narrative is about planting seeds is about turning people over to do your bidding mk ultra is just one arm of a bigger umbrella that is about social engineering uh, what is about dante how can he say that if he isn't sure though it was about getting people to do unconscionable things when i just to clarify this dante when i saw 99 percent of the people in canada in my part of the world supporting the invasion bombing of afghanistan i was blown away through all the history that we knew that we know right through all the information that we know i saw almost everyone that i talked to support the invasion of afghanistan right that is as you say it was about getting people to do unconscionable things for me it blew me away that was unconscionable okay and we can talk about invasion of iraq we can talk about uh, the 2008 financial collapse scam we can talk about bombing of syria destruction of libya right those are unconscionable acts that a huge percentage of our communities, our societies support it. Unbelievable. That's part of social engineering. Since it is RT, it neglects to include that similar things were done on a vastly large scale in the Soviet Union and China during that time. This does not forgive any of it, just gives context. Agreed, post-apocalypse, yeah. Well, after people say World War II ended, in 1944 1945 right but it didn't end for the eastern bloc the soviet union committed some horrendous acts in the eastern bloc they killed hundreds of thousands of people millions of people in the gulags and stuff like this right what is mk ultra uh, do a search for mk ultra sleepy waves mk ultra is basically a government program cia program to get people as dante said to assassinate people to commit her commit horrendous crimes to control people mk ultra was not about lying to the masses it was trying to control individuals and get uh confessions out of them but dante the techniques they learned through mk ultra and they used some of the techniques they had learned by through bernese to fine-tune their work it's not separate from social engineering MK Ultra was a government project. I I wouldn't say it was. I think it is a government project from 1950s to 1970s officially where they tried to create mind control tactics for torture purposes, I believe. From torture purposes, I believe. The study of propaganda doesn't really connect with that. Sidney Gottlieb was a key figure, a chemist, IIRC. Uh, what does IRRC mean, gang? I don't know what that acronym means. I gotta look it up. Who um, pioneered the project, was highly, highly unethical, broke loads of laws, and was illegal throughout. Used stuff like LSD uh, over uh, psychoactive substances to gain uh, control over the substance uh, subjects' minds. Chicho life. The Nazis got Germans to allow them to murder tens of millions of people. That doesn't mean they used mind control tactics. That, I'm, I'm more talking about the social engineering. Once you get a whole population supporting a war of aggression or a war invasion, you are killing millions of people. 
the invasion of Afghanistan has killed hundreds of thousands of people, right? So where do we draw the line? Are we talking about those people pulling the trigger or the masses supporting an invasion? Libya has resulted in how many deaths? We don't even know. Iraq has resulted in how many deaths? We don't even know. Over a million by many accounts, right? The U.S. at the beginning stages of the Iraq invasion said, we're not going to do body counts anymore, right? I'm reading about the Soviet reign right now. Alexander Solis, Sohal, I can't pronounce that, is an amazing author. If I recall correctly, ah, I, I, RC, I got to use that, man. If I recall correctly, if I recall correctly, if I remember correctly. Okay, sweet. Thank you very much. I, I, RC, I'm going to start using that and always take what I say with an I, I, RC attached to my comments okay uh, because I'm, I'm not really looking into the nitty-gritty little fine-tuning of things of this event and this event and this event even though I know some of them because I, I that's what the phase I was in many years ago right oh this happened what was all the links connecting there right I, I like taking a look at the grand picture of where we're headed and uh, according to the reaction we're seeing from the OPC Doma docs and people not talking about it um, we still got a lot of work to do uh, Chicho that's not my point look propaganda uh, look propaganda is not the same as mind control and as far as I know MK Ultra had nothing to do with controlling the masses okay we can we can separate them if you like Dante you can control the masses with regular propaganda uh, to what level for sure you can control the masses with regular propaganda but can you can you control the masses by just regular propaganda to get them to commit horrendous atrocities throughout history we've seen that but because we have so much information available to us right now through wikileaks and other amazing journalists out there and platforms where whistleblowers are releasing information then you want to make okay we make a distinction then i would say more harsher techniques are needed than regular propaganda you don't need lsd experiments yes absolutely okay if you want to make a distinction we can make a distinction right but mass psychosis can be brought about then not using lsd you can use it through shutting people's logistical and analytical abilities through tv programs through movies really the the alpha state you go into when you're zoned into a show is pretty deep you can plant anything you want imagery is huge so back to the opcw leakage if these docs show that it was unjust for the u.s to bomb syria u.s uk and france syria how is that any different from all the other times they drone drop bombs in syria because the whole propaganda machine the democrats the republic the media was pushing for the united states to invade uh, syria right it's not different it's just much more grand and the different factor of it is opcw was supposed to be a separate organization not politicized politicized scientists conducting investigations and releasing that information without a political bias opcw is completely compromised now it is basically just like the atlantic council it's basically the pentagon coming out and saying we need to go and bomb somewhere here because they did this that's what the opcw has now become which is crazy which is horrendous right like why this uh, specific incident that's the reason it reveals that the opcw has been compromised which was supposed to be totally separate from the united states military arm right the recent mass control methods in china are being exported to dictatorships in the rest of the world through direct business contracts and they will be coming to the western world and they are here in large part as well dude radicalized muslims freely uh, decided to go to syria to butcher infidels there was no mind 
control involved. It was just radicalized rhetoric. But radicalization is mind control. Radicalization, Dante, I consider radicalization mind control. What, what else would it be? Would you not agree that radicalization is mind control? ISIS did use their own propaganda to spread their message and gain uh, recruits. Yes, that's what I'm saying. It was just regular old propaganda. I don't think it's regular propaganda. Regular propaganda I consider to be way more benign, right? Like Disney is regular propaganda, even though there's subliminal messages there that tells people to with kids and we can go deep into it but i'd rather not right simple simple cheap not sophisticated not involving any other sci-fi methods of mind control it's not mind control as mk ultra tried to achieve okay so mk ultra would be surgery and because they're cutting people open literally some of them and regular propaganda would be taking pharmaceuticals right it, do we draw the distinction there i don't know for me it's all under one umbrella dante to me it's under one umbrella right if you can deprogram people that have been through mk ultra right and mk ultra was horrendous they gave people lsd canadian families sued the u.s government for experimenting on their family members who ended up dying like one of the people that mk ultra involved that they gave LSD to people unsuspectingly, huge doses of LSD. And supposedly there were people that jumped off the, the balcony and killed themselves because they were just tripping balls, right? Now, were they thrown off or did they jump off themselves? Who knows? We don't know, right? But the US government settled, gave money to Canadian families for conducting an illegal experiments on their family members. So sure, MK Ultra was them directly feeding people drugs torturing them electric shocking them and all that jazz but those reports that information was really and some of the L mk ultra dante involved electrical shocking them exposing to people to visuals and sound which is really directly connected to what we're seeing through entertainment right so that that is a part of it there's a huge link there yeah, it is a stretch for people to bring MK Ultra in. There, there are other sources that are more related. Yeah, MK Ultra has taken it to the limit, right? Off-topic question, Chicho. How much time does someone need to practice steady a day to learn a new skill? Average. I don't know. It depends on the skill. Sleepy waves. It really depends on the skill. Yeah, I wouldn't cite MK Ultra when trying to explain why people believe. The New York Times. No, I wouldn't directly go there for sure, Dante. I agree with you there. MK Ultra has taken it to the limit, right? But New York Times is programming. Pro like seriously, I've had discussions over the years with people who continue to co consume mainstream news sources, and I talk to them. I go, look, they lie to you about Iraq. They lie to you about Afghanistan. They lie to you about the 2008 financial scam right they lie to you about libya they lie to you about syria and you still read and listen to this crap like what like i i wish i could grab them and shake them and go what are you doing what are you doing what are you doing just stop it right but they won't do it as far as i see it once it reaches that level they are completely brainwashed there, there is no other there's nothing else you can say about that right they are programmed what what do they need to kick out of that programming i really don't know right is it huge doses of uh, entheogens possibly is it for them to travel to stop their work to stop their responsibility pull all their money out of wall street and be disconnected from the system long enough for them to be able to breathe and realize oh my god they're living a lie is that what it is right could be asmr right that's one of the reasons i started once people started asking me to do asmr once i started doing the asmr people would contact me and say chicho your stuff has helped me tremendously to realize what is going on not specifically this political stuff but 
comic book stuff, right? The mathematics, just the different things. People need to be kicked out of that rhythm that they're in. That to me is brainwashing programming. Let's say a skill like an instrument, like an instrument, sleepy waves. Uh, I don't know. I practice when I start playing drums, I was practicing hours a day and it wasn't, I wasn't natural at it. And I reached a level where I got a tremendous amount of joy out of it. Uh, I was in a couple of bands and we played and I would still, there were days I would practice eight hours a day. I would, my fingers would bleed, right? Uh, because I wasn't natural at it. So it really depends if you're natural or not. You would just have to try. I think if you're trying to improve home your skills on anything, what you need to do is do that thing and see if you want to spend more time on it. If you're spending a lot of time on it, you're going to improve. The rate you're going to improve at is really dependent on if you're natural at it or not. They say like 10,000 uh, 10, hours to become proficient. That doesn't mean you won't be any good before 10,000 hours. It is a very large topic, very large topic. It's diminishing returns. The first 1,000 hours will give you the most improvement. Yeah, I agree with Dante, right? You, boop, and then you're going to level out, right? It's like going to the gym, people working out. The people, there's a huge branch of people that just do physical activity and stuff, they're healthy and stuff. There's a whole branch that are trying to become professional that is huge and only a small fraction reach that level because it's that 5%, 10% extra you need that requires so much more time than what you have already put in to reach the 90% or 80% level. Hey, hey, drummer, you, drummers unite. I've been drumming since uh, 2013. I love it so much. Me too. I used to. I stopped drumming a long time ago. On an unrelated note, I submitted some of my university applications today. Nice, Jacoby. Awesome. So Bellingcat is funded by warlords, basically. Yeah. The series uh, Minefield by Vsauce on YouTube is now available for free. Covers different topics about the mind. Cool. Don't you also find it uh, disgusting how it costs roughly $80 per application for university? Does it now? <laughs> <laughs> it is disgusting but i guess they need to pay people to review those applications or is it just automatic the university in in university is still good if you're going in there for a right degree and stuff like this which is fantastic right uh, but be careful the type of degree you're getting and how much time you're spending there and how you are being educated right in and out that's what you're in there for it is so, so expensive to just send in your apps. Yeah, and you have to send it into a whole bunch of different universities, right? That can add up. 10 universities, $800. That's just application. Wait until you start looking how much the courses and the books cost, right? You don't need to call it like that. I like minefields. Can recommend. Yeah, Dante? Okay, cool. If I remember, I'll go to it. And if you guys remember, please post it in, uh, I guess, philosophy uh, in our discord page or anywhere else you think it's uh, it fits in okay yes i particularly like the coverage and social behavior cool cool i like uh, adam curtis's century of the south and adam curtis has produced a lot of work like that we're at two two uh past two hours it's more about science is it okay throw it in science dante if you remember up time up time neuroscience and psychology okay cool so we've been streaming for two hours and 15 minutes i'm studying computer science hoping to specialize in artificial intelligence or perhaps a data science area mainly want to get into ai to figure out how to prevent it <laughs> awesome more power to you brother also this is very ignorant but the reason the u.s wage war was that they thought syria used chemical weapons against their citizens no the reason they waged war on syria was because of all like countless other reasons other than the chemical attacks right that there was it wasn't because of that the last thing the united states military gives a rats about is civilians okay we know that throughout history we know that as of right now right no that was the justification that was a justification to the people 
of the United States and the Western people, and people were fully supporting it. Okay, the reason was to get Syria out of Iran's and Russia's sphere of influence. Uh, in large part, that was that was a huge part of it. Russia has a um, uh, navy base in Syria. It's their only navy base in that region. Okay, it has to do with the Levant, the Greater Levant, who controls it. There is water there. There is gas there. There's oil there. Okay, it has to do with the Shiite Crescent. It has to do with pipelines coming out of the Pars gas field, right? If you go to my site, uh, uh, Sleepy Waves, go into Iran, you'll see one article I wrote, uh, which is uh, here. Let me find it for you. Uh, let's just go here. Chicho.com. And I'll take you to Blockspot. Go to Iran. Boop. Uh, target is uh, is still Iran. Du, du, du. Here, here's one article on Iran. Uh, it says target is target is still Iran. And I wrote this in 2013. Clear cutting the Middle East and the coming bloodbath. Mapping World War Three. Okay. This article. And uh, the other article is this one, which is linked up again with Syria. Uh, lest we forget, an attack on Syria is an attack on Iran and a threat to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. This, and again, I wrote this one, I released this one in 2013. And that'll give you a pretty good idea of what Syria was all about. Uh, can you link me to some blog posts? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry, I meant that, that, that. By the way, is a stream a while ago, few months, I believe. You mentioned a book called Dune, and I'm gonna go buy it tomorrow. Awesome, excited to read Jacoby. You're gonna love it. Read Dune, read Dune. My pleasure, Sleepy Waves. Okay, gang, let's call the stream. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you for my correction. War against peace. I wanna remember that. I'm gonna look into that further because my memory has. I I R C if I remember correctly, right? Um, thank you for being here. Um, I like sharing this information. I think it's important to share, and we'll continue to do more Julian Assange streams. And this was stream number seven. I still haven't loaded up uh, live stream number six, or done the OPCW doc readings. I was about, I was about to do the OPCW doc readings, and then um, they released more stuff. So I think I actually recorded it, but I have to go back and read it again and re-release it. Okay. Oh man, I came late again. The schedule is on Discord, right? Yeah. I, this is the last stream that I've scheduled. We're going to take a break for the holidays. And uh, we'll probably be back next week, next weekend. Okay. Maybe Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay. Until then, I hope uh, you guys have a fantastic break. Ge uh, uh, geographical based spheres of influence is outdated as a concept influence is now mixed and global yeah big time big time but the crescent uh, uh shia crescent is real the pipelines are real right and where the resources are are real for sure okay gang hope you guys have a fantastic saturday fantastic weekend fantastic break fantastic holiday okay I'll see you guys in the next stream. And thank you for the conversations. Dante, thank you for taking care of business. Enjoy your time then. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you, brother. To you as well, Jacoby. Bye, everyone.